uh, Chicano Studies. This is Victor and Terrence, if there's anyone in your discipline that's working on that. Um, DSPS, um, there's obviously, and there's 12 different areas uh, where standards have been modified. Uh, health Services, there's a bell. Let's check with that. Uh, learning assistance or learning skills, I don't know. Oh yeah, I guess that would be deaf, right? Um, represents them. Kinesiology, I guess that would be Dan, Sergio. Non-credit, uh, that's adult education. I don't know if they have a representative or who talks to about that. Okay. Uh, so we don't have full-time faculty in adult ed, so it's not representative. We have one. And there's 12 areas of non-credit um, from work experience, parent education, and math and English that are um, updated. Peace studies, I should know it's still around. Um, I guess that would be social science. Pharmacy technology has changed. And work experience. Uh, Marianne, was that your area? Yes. So, um, what would be nice is if you would contact the people that you know um, are relevant here and just ask them if uh, they've got the information, if they find it uh, relevant, if there's any questions they have, or if they're just ducky. You know, <coughs> keep the communication open. So, that would be nice. Thank you. So uh, the third item is reviewing minimum qualifications and local standards. Um, when the committee presented at the coordinating committee in November, uh, the question on the table was, when are these qualifications reviewed? And so we thought a little bit about that. And number one is, of course, when a position is flown or a hiring pool open. And that's for full-time or part-time, because part-timers must have the same minimum quals or local standards that full-timers have. So whenever that's going on, obviously there's a serious review of the standards. Right now, according to the HR website, 25 departments have positions being announced. Mm. Another formal time is when faculty service areas are decided by departments. We did that a few years back and haven't had to worry about them, which is a good thing. <laughs> and then these, this is, these are kind of informal. Um, the qualifications of faculty are relevant when we evaluate peers, apply for salary credit, apply for sabbatical, which is a section that talks about that. Even revising course outlines requires discipline knowledge. And of course, accreditation also has a section that talks about how we determine our local standards and by what process we do So um, if, if there's not any other ideas about that, we'd like to propose a more regular review of the qualifications. And it might be nice to do it every two years when this new, these, these new standards are published. It'd be perfect. I'm sorry, just a question. Um, full time and part time have to have the same yes. qualifications. Was that always so? Yes. And um, the qualifications make one um, um, eligible to teach the entire curriculum, not just uh, one course or a subset of courses. Then. State Senate is very uh, interested in making sure we don't set up a second class or a divided class of individuals. So and that's why the qualifications need to be what they are in some cases. I don't know, Julie, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but this is just their degree. Do they have the degree necessary? Right. Yeah, right. Right. The other qualifications that you might look for in a full time are preferred. Right. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I guess that's some of it. Because I think in the arts, it's a little sticky. Yeah. Maybe, you know, in that case, work experience might, and publications, productions, and stuff might come into play as, as importantly as degrees. So anyway, if we could do this every two years, it would be nice. So we would report to the Senate as I'm doing now, or whoever's doing it. Chairs Council, Dean's meeting, division reps will know, they can announce it, and the major department meetings and attention. So since we're talking about the reviews, and I've included not only some key pages from this report, uh, which shows you the background history, it shows you that it's organized around three categories for positions where a master's is usually expected and for uh, situations where the master's is not expected. 
So it just shows you the range of incredible talent that people we have on campus and all the stuff people are learning every day. Um, but here's some things to keep in mind uh, under part four here, considerations. A, departments are free to keep the minimum qualifications. B, the minimum qualifications mirror the old general credential as in high school, social science area, language arts, physical education, Bill Nye the science guy. Um, so, uh, and they're designed to provide leeway for small rural colleges. C, departments satisfied with the minimum qualifications can use their preferred qualifications to ensure the specialized knowledge for their curriculum needs. D, AB 1725, intends that more rigorous local standards be expected and encouraged. Here's a quote from <coughs> that law. The hiring process should be focused on ensuring that community colleges will select teachers who can teach and who are experts in the subject matter of their curriculum and counselors, librarians, and other instructional and student services faculty who can foster community college effectiveness and who are experts in the subject matter of their specialty. This means that the colleges may establish criteria for hiring that go well beyond the minimum qualifications set by regulation. The establishment of additional criteria of this sort should be expected and encouraged. E, the 2014 disciplines list reiterates, one, quote, districts may establish local qualifications beyond the minimum standards defined in the disciplines list, page 14, and two, Quote, further, these lists only reflect the statewide minimums for persons to be considered qualified to teach in a discipline. Each district may establish additional qualifications which are more rigorous than those listed here in page 52. F, local standards must be more rigorous than minimum qualifications. And G, local standards must be justified in terms of curriculum need and collegial duties. Five, here are some examples of local standards. In the last two pages, I've included our list of uh, disciplines that follow the state minimums and those who have established the local standards to give you an idea of how people approach this. Uh, here's some examples. Some disciplines require any BA with two years of experience, any AA with six years of experience. And of course, that's because people are expert in barbering or uh, baking. Um, their AA uh, might not be relevant. It's, it's their expertise that want, you know, what do our students need to know, who are the people who know that. But they may require um, the BA, so broadcast technology decided to go to the BA minimum. Or additional licenses, list licenses or certificates, some of which have been developed since 1990. Uh, paralegal and real estate um, use that criteria. Uh, athletic training requires an MA plus additional certification. Some disciplines allow, quote, a BA in the discipline and an MA in a related field. Again, this is somewhat based on the high school model. They may, but uh, the disciplines may require an MA level knowledge in the discipline or eliminate redundancy when other disciplines have their own departments. And here are examples from anthropology, economics, English, and psychology that have uh, focused and specialized their knowledge. Uh, number five there, applicants with these other degrees may be eligible for the hiring pool through the equivalency process depending on their coursework. They say sociology, but they may have focused on uh, psychosocial situations or small groups and uh, one might find that relevant for your curriculum. And finally, discipline may seek a requirement of particular length or type of work experience. So counseling requires counseling experience in an educational setting and administration of justice also requires local experience in public service. And you can look at the more detailed list. And I'd like to ask your advice on part three here, uh, page three. The committee is still tinkering with this, but we wonder if this would be considered a, a fair depiction of the process here for our procedure standpoint. Um, so I guess I'll just read it quickly then. A, the faculty in each discipline or area are encouraged to review their hiring qualifications and curricular needs and establish or revise their own local standards and or pre-established equivalencies. And then it has the quote from 87.225 that I read you and the quote from the discipline's list. B, however, local standards and pre-established equivalency must be reviewed by the hiring standards committee to ensure that they are more rigorous than minimum qualifications. 
that need for more rigorous, this is articulated in the quote from the code and a quote from the discipline's list. C, the discipline and the faculty will provide the hiring standards committee their typo, sorry, their proposal, rationale, and full documentation. D, the discipline representatives may attend the meeting where the proposal is discussed. E, the approval of the local standard or pre-established equivalency requires a majority of the committee's quorum. I just wonder if you have any questions or suggestions on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've looked at, um, according to our, our green sheet, it does say that we recommend to board local standards that exceed state and qual. It's not a question of approving or denying. It's a question of making sure they meet the state requirements for increased rigor. So really, in some ways, it's kind of a technical review. You know, sometimes we work kind of like curriculum. We have a, you know, departments want something, but they can't get it unless they can put it in form and language and make an argument that, state overseers and others can articulate it. So we think that it also shows um, good faith deliberation on our part so that the implication is not that people are just um, raising standards for raising standards sake. So um, I think, you know, it's interesting. Uh, since local standards are a right of a department, um, you know, it'd be an interesting question if we said no, but I think that we could advise against one if it didn't seem to have the proper justification. Yeah, it's my concern with E. Then maybe, e? Yeah, maybe you clarify it more. Okay. Uh, in that last section. Okay. Because right. otherwise it comes out that I don't think you're just saying that. <laughs> so. um, well, can, the committee might advise against it. It, it seems like it doesn't, if it's not justified. But, but if um, it's more rigorous than the fall. But that's, 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 that's actually it's not as easy to understand as it looks, but I guess they were trying to just serve the department. So I'll, um, I'll we'll talk about that in the next as we support. You say you want to review every two years. Are you talking about the local standards? You want those reviewed or everybody want, should be reviewing their standards? Well, the question that a coordinating committee is, how often do we, do we all, are we all aware of our minimum qualifications? How they fit in with the state minimums? Are we all aware of our local standards if we have them? And are we, um, you know, conscientiously thinking about them periodically? So I think that's the question um, they asked at Port Inn Committee. So we're thinking of some way of having them a little more regular. So we can say that we announce them and people should take a look and have a moment. If, if a department wants to keep the same local standards as that department had two years ago, can they just keep it or do they have to do a whole other justification and go to the committee? And I think once it's established, we just presume it carries on, though there have been uh, two departments that have modified their local standards because they weren't getting sufficient candidates. So uh, engineering um, actually returned to the minimum. And psychology did some adjustment, right? I think a little bit. So I guess that shows that it is, it is, it's supposed to be an ongoing process. And I think that changes too, like with engineering and, and psychology, it, it changes over time because there's times when people, where there's plenty of faculty available to hire and then there are times when they're just, they went into industry and there's just nobody. I think it's true. But things have changed from 1990 uh, right. in terms of you know, how many psychology degrees we put together and yeah. stuff like that. So it would probably be a good idea to review local falls every two years, at least so, yeah, we want to stick with this one. Any other discussion? I'll move to approve by the ASCII for that. Okay. We'll get a more formal. You want to present something more formal later? Eventually. Okay. We can wait then. Thank you so much for Thanks. Thanks for the time. Good morning, colleagues. Um, Dr. Schilling and I 
have uh, come today to ask this body to accept the final version of the follow-up report. Uh, last week, Dr. Schilling attended the meeting and asked for comments, and having received none, we have come to ask for the final acceptance. There are no, there are no comments on the website either. Oh, there is a, comment, a comment on the discussion board. Um, so, but it wasn't from, uh, well, I don't actually, we don't know who it was from. It was a guest. So, but it wasn't anything to add to the report. So the report it was just a comment about the report. Okay. And, then, and that's public if anyone wants to take a look at that. Um, I was just curious, so, uh, the report mentions a campus forum uh, that took place in July. Uh, I don't recall. Campus <coughs> forum or a smaller, was it just a... No, it was, we met in the, uh, in the uh, teleconference center. It was very well attended. It was, we just, <laughs> yeah, it was right after. I remember attending something where there's hardly anyone there. Yeah, right after the report came out, we uh, conducted a meeting with the Dean and Vice Dean of Admissions, and then the Dean of Admissions and the Vice Dean of the former steering committee, those who had worked on the self-evaluation, and we also invited the, the campus, anyone who wanted to attend. It was July, so a lot of faculty weren't, weren't in attendance, but we wanted to immediately have that discussion. And we passed out a timeline, um, the recommendations, and then we identified, we discussed who would be responsible for addressing each of those actions. So that was the form. Were you there, Tracy? Do you I remember? Was, yeah, I, was, I remember. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, it's all coming back. Okay. <laughs> I move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We approve the accreditation report. So that'll go before the board tomorrow night. <coughs> All right, sure. Government document, uh, department chairs. I mean, sorry, coordinating, and coordinating had a couple of issues with this. So under the purposes, there used to be a list of things <coughs> that were responsible for, uh, that the chairs were responsible, that the chairs committee was responsible for making recommendations on, and they basically listed the, some of the 10 plus one, the ones that were most relevant to chairs themselves. Um, the coordinating committee did not like that. They felt like there were other committees trying to do some of the same things as the list that we have there, and they were like hiring standards, scheduling. Um, I can't remember exactly, but there was a, so they suggested that we just go with the 10 plus one of the faculty senate. I did um, make that change. So whatever falls within the purview of the 10 plus one of the faculty senate, then the uh, chairs would have an opportunity to discuss and advise the faculty senate on those. Um, so that was a change that was made. The other change that was made was the membership. So the membership initially in, uh, included all current department chairs, as well as a faculty uh, senate representative. Um, I actually just had a change of heart on that. I just I felt like that the committee was due, and I worried a little bit about it um, uh, kind of floundering and not not really having a good direction, especially because now the purposes have changed, and it's it's just whatever falls within that 10 plus 1. Um, but then I decided that really isn't the committee's responsibility. That's actually the Senate President's responsibility to make sure that they're connecting with the committees and the committees have all the information they need to do the job they need. So while I think it would be beneficial to have a Senate uh, representative on there, I don't think it's necessary. I think that's up to the Senate leadership, the Senate President, to make sure they're keeping in contact with the committee. So I did take that off as well. The final change that was suggested was they uh, coordinating one of the quorum change to a majority of those present. But as Carl pointed out, there's a problem with that because that's actually decision making, the majority of people present, not quorum. Um, so quorum, the chairs, uh, and this was all sent out to the chairs and they made comments and I took those into account, asked for their approval, nobody said no, so we're we moving forward. Um, but they wanted it left at 33%. 33% of all the chairs, there's 62, is about 20 people. 
Um, we're consistently getting between 40 and 45, so 20 we thought was a safe number to make sure that we could go ahead with the meeting with 20 chairs. So the chairs would like to leave that at 33%. Um, and that was the only change, or well, the only change yet. So unless, someone, unless you have a comment, we can. Uh, I think I get this um, something on the first, yeah. the first section. Just to get through coordinating, that it says promote collaboration among departments and with the administration the best use student needs, and advise on the best use of department, division, or college resources, or just create another bullet that says advise on best use of department. New bullet. Okay. They want to coordinating really wants to make sure that this is an advisory recommending committee, so that's why I advise. Discussion? Question about the quorum there. Yeah. The statement all recommended revisions must be forwarded to the coordinating committee for review. For quorum. Mm -hmm. And this is the Senate committee? Mm -hmm. That's standard. Must be? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the year. So the committees, all committees review their quorum at the beginning of the year and then they just email the coordinating and say we're going to stay with our quorum or we're going to change it. Do we have a motion to approve this to send us on to coordinating? Are we coordinating on Monday? So moved. Second. Second. Angela Armando. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Fantastic. So hopefully by next Monday then we'll be, it'll have to go to the board on the 18th. Uh, that is information only. The board does not approve this committee. Coordinating does. Uh, so we wait for the board to be informed on the 18th and hopefully by February 26th. This is the committee and can elect their own chairs at that time. That's what we're hoping for. Um, great. Uh, Dr. Johnson's going to be here in about 15 minutes. Uh, he had another meeting to attend, so we're going to postpone him and move on to issues and solutions for online instructors. I am not an online instructor, so I'm hoping you guys have issues. <laughs> well, I hope you don't have issues, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I am currently teaching two online classes. Um, I think one of the biggest issues would be knowing if they're attending or not. There's no way to know if they've even logged in. You see them there, but you don't know if they've logged in, how many days they've logged in. Um, there's no way to know if they've completed your lessons either. There's, there's absolutely no way. I, I do discussion questions, and they're linked to lessons, but Sometimes we probably could just kind of like fake it and get through it. Um, so I think those would be the two biggest issues. Please. Are you using um, Talonet? Yeah. So Talonet under the statistics feature shows you who's logging in, oh, okay. how much they're logging in, what they're using. It shows the most frequent user. I mean, it tells you how many times they log in per week if you want to get down to that you know, micro That's level cool. with that. But it's under um, site editor and statistics. Okay, cool. Thank you. No, there's there's nothing that's gonna show me if they have complete lessons or anything, right? It's just showing you how many like how often they log in. It'll show you how often okay. you log in. Thank you. If I could add something to that, I use the assignment box. Okay. So I have them submit their assignments to the assignment box and I make them check the honor pledge right. right. You know, that just Kind of keeps me, yeah. You know, it keeps There's the honest that. people honest. Sure, that's all it is. <laughs> and I, I developed a chat session that I have once a week, and I make it mandatory. There's no extra points for it. It's mandatory. It's like attending class, and I tell them that in the very beginning. All right. Thank you. Yeah, well, 
we've been tasked with this gigantic thing that apparently doesn't exist. This came out of the, this was one of the strategic goals for the college, and then the faculty center was put in charge of that. It's the primary goal. Okay. So I was at the meeting that they were in the brainstorming that, and Carlos on the state brought up the issue that um, specifically he was concerned about issues of academic integrity and ensuring integrity in the classes, that the students taking the classes are the ones who are actually enrolled in the classes, how, you know, issues, how do we prevent cheating, plagiarism, so forth. So um, you may want to um, reach out to him, actually, and talk to him and find out if he'd like to address Yeah, I have, I have touched with fellows, I haven't heard back from him yet. Yeah. So I think also TVLC has been working on some things. You know, that quality matters rubric for, for sort of mm -hmm. assessing the quality of courses. And I, I think if, they're, if we're unhappy with some part of town, that, I mean, that's our committee that should be attacking that. So I don't know if they might have more for your list. Okay. And that's, um, that's Monica? Uh, Stephanie is the chair. Stephanie, I'm Stephanie, I'm sorry. And if they're doing writing assignments, they can just turn it in. I mean, you know, once the assignment is turned in, you can go ahead and use that, and you can see, you know, you can catch plagiarism. And, you know, that hasn't been a problem that I see, that I've been Julie? I guess some of the questions that are being brought up, I'm not quite sure how they really differ from the issues that occur in traditional classroom settings, as far as plagiarism goes. I, I think we have the same... I mean, maybe if you have a class of 20, it's easier to figure it out, but I can say classes of 60, you have the same issues. But I also think in homework, I think integrity is integrity, and people can, students can cheat if they want to cheat, no matter if traditional setting or online. In class, though, we do have, say, the photo rosters. Um, and so if students are taking an exam right there, even with 60 students, one can make sure that the students taking the exam aren't the students. We have had some cases, it seems, where one student registers for an online class and another person is doing all everything for that class. I wish that had been documented. Um, there was something with speech, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it was something. It, it was actually happened in one of my online classes where, um, and but that was a, a very a bigger issue where students were, the students enrolled in the class were not the students completing the work. This tied into a bigger issue that was affecting online classes in Southern California, that there was a young man who started a business and he was, uh, you know, recruiting clients and completing their online, and his employees completed their online classes for them for large, large sums of money. And um, I believe it originated at Saddleback College. But you know, you get a good business model and people start <laughs> copying it. And so um, in that case, the guy who was in charge of the issue in Saddleback College, he's been arrested, charged, sentenced, and serving a prison term for that. But that model exists other places. And in online classes, you have to really be paying attention to try to um, document that. And the way my case found out, um, I knew the students were international students, and I went to International Student Services at the time to find out what was going on and found out that one of the students taking my online class, who supposedly came to my live orientation, has actually never even set foot in the country. And so someone misrepresented them at the orientation and it just led to a snowball. And so it was documented and reported, and in fact, eventually, I think, uh, even Homeland Security looked into the issue. Yeah. <laughs> Two individuals have their thesis reflected. Anything else? <coughs> the only other, um, the only complaint that I've really heard has less to do with students and more to do with the faculty teaching it. Um, and I think this is true, uh, even at face to face, you know, faculty talk about this. You know, so and so is not doing as much in their classroom as I do. Um, and that's what I've heard a lot of. I have talked with um, Solomon about that because um, in order to ensure that the course, so legally all we can really do 
um, is we can do part, make an online class part of the evaluation and evaluate their teaching as according to that online uh, according to that evaluation form, which we don't currently do. That's not required for online. Um, if you're evaluated and you're teaching three face to face, they can evaluate in those classes, not in your online classes. Um, but there's um, there was another. That's issue. not necessarily true because I teach online classes and I got notification. Again, in Anthro, there were problems and we had to bump our, our evaluations to this semester. But um, my online classes, um, the, you know, there's a request sent out to the students in the online class to fill out an evaluation on the faculty evaluation. No, peer evaluation. <coughs> oh, peer evaluation. Peer evaluation. Okay, sorry. Right. Um, so there's no peer evaluation requirement. Now, instructors have turned, uh, asked their evaluation team to review their online material. Um, but that is not required uh, by the union. In fact, it doesn't even say anything about online or not online. So as a result, uh, the way the, the contracts are written about evaluation is it's very big. So there's no way to actually ask uh, a faculty, can I evaluate your online class? They kind of have to offer uh, to allow the evaluation team to do that. I'm not sure if that's the way we want to go. We really want to get that in. I have talked to Solomon about it. Um, but again, these are complaints coming from online teachers about other, and they're not names, they're just, I know that other people aren't doing what I do in my class. I don't teach online, so I really don't know that much about it. So this is news to me, because every time I have an evaluation of somebody has an online class, I ask them to add me to the class, and then I come back. And I, I mean, I've just always done it. So I didn't know that there was anything to the contrary. There's not anything to the contrary. That's the problem. That's the issue. The, the evaluation article, when you read that, mm -hmm. there's nothing in there about online classes. So a faculty could say, that's not in here, we don't have to do that. And faculty have said that. And wow. that is accurate, because there's nothing in the assignment article about online classes. They can volunteer. I think someone had mentioned um, something. Didn't one of you over there mention the, the, the thing that TVLC was doing? The, Oh well, so but that's why you have this quality matters, right? Would you, that would be available. Right. Not, that's not necessarily in their right. peer evaluation, just if you would like to work at the class. And that's voluntary. Yes. Yeah. So I don't. Um, you guys can think about that. Solomon's not here today, um, but uh, you can read the evaluation article yourself. It says nothing about online classes. Does it need to know? Yeah. I don't know. If it's talking about your courses, your classes, it doesn't have to specify whether you're talking about ones in a classroom or in a, in an online. I don't. I don't teach online, so this really isn't that much of an issue for me. So I don't. I don't know. We only have one online class in our entire department. If if a peer evaluation team wanted access to the online materials and the faculty member being evaluated said no, I think that would merit and needs improvement even under the current system uh, when it comes to, you know, fulfills responsibilities, and has positive relationships with colleagues. And, I mean, we have items that kind of cover that. Yeah, but I, we do the same day way. I've evaluated online instructors before and um, I've never heard of anybody saying no, but it seems like if they did, I, yeah, it's part of the process. Yeah, I have not heard of anybody saying no, but again, when I talk to Solomon, there's no provision in there that says online courses. So. But is that something, I guess, when I hear you asking the question, presenting the fact that you're talking to Solomon about that, I, I agree that if somebody says no, I think that it, it, you know, it's, it's not a good thing in that peer evaluation process in general for that person going to continue. Um, from a grievance standpoint, yeah, you can't really, if it's not in the language, you really can't um, hold them accountable to that. But in terms of looking at our evaluation process, it is part of this body's purview. That's so right. so I, I don't know what you're asking is, do we want to have a more formal conversation about that to have Solomon here to make sure he's here? Um, and, and if you really look at that, because it seems to me that a faculty is going through and there are those five classes, and two of them happen to be online, that we're only going to then evaluate them for three classes, and two, they really have no, I mean, they can go either way based on what you're saying scenario-wise. I think, real quick, Angela, I think some of the problem, too, um, I, in, in my department, we only have one. So one full-timer teaches, I think, two online classes of the same class. But we wouldn't even know how to evaluate that because we don't teach program? online, right? So the evaluators have never asked to evaluate that online class because we wouldn't know what we were doing. 
So well, that's just, another issue. Well, I was going to say that I think, again, this comes in play, going back to what Julie said, that we've got to stop treating these as different classes, that the language in the evaluation suggests that we evaluators can evaluate by visiting your class. Your online class is another context, another setting. I should be able to go and look at that. And if I can comment on your instructional methods in a traditional classroom, your communication with students in a traditional classroom and so forth, I think <coughs> the language is general enough in that form that that extends to the online classroom as well. Now I have heard anecdotally of faculty who got written up in their evaluations because of online materials and fought it on the basis that the evaluation form does makes no mention about online classes, but I actually think it's a fallacy of language. It's talking about classrooms and our teaching, and I think it should extend to both. Yep. The only other issue that I have heard, is there any more discussion on that issue? So we can re-agendize this and uh, have Solomon speak to this as well. Um, is um, the training process for actually becoming qualified to teach online. And I've heard lots and lots and lots of complaints about this. Um, it's about 150 hours, is what I'm told. I've not done it, but I've told it's about 150 hours. <laughs> Four years learning. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, she's not here, is she so good? Yeah. She's not here. No. Um, I, I, I just want to say that when I finished the training, I, I didn't feel like I knew how to use the site at all. I didn't know how to use the site until I looked at a colleague's site. Um, I felt like the training was not um, showing me tools, like really the great tools that, that um, Telenet can do. Uh, because it's a Sakai platform that was taken from Etudes. Um, and so when I took a like 15 week course on Etudes, then I learned how to use Talonet better. Um, and it was only then. And um, also the Sakai is really not, it's, it's ugly, it's boring. You can't change it, but <coughs> whatever. That's just like my personal thing. But I don't think the training, and the training needs to be changed. It needs to be more, I mean, what I got from it was a lot of copyright stuff, which I already know about copyright. Um, and I didn't get enough, like I said, enough knowledge on how to use the site and really make a really great website. I, I feel bad for the class that I taught right after I took training because it, I feel so sorry for them. It looked awful. It looked terrible. And then I took the Etudes certification and it looks so much better now. So. We're also moving. Are you going to be yes. No, no. We're going to have to get more certifications. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> Michelle? Where did you hear that? There's discussions going on about moving it. <coughs> so. That would be a TBLC discussion that I don't think they're at. I mean, the state is working on a platform. Yeah. Right. right. The state is working on a platform. You know, I, I apologize. I wish I felt better. I know okay. I know this. I just am not accessing it. Okay. I want to say that it came from Rick, but do not go and say that to him because it might not. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I really don't remember, but I will check into where I heard that at. But I think you're right. It came from the state. Uh, the state wants a consistent platform. Um, but I do, as far as I know, they're not going to force anybody to move into that platform once they do it anyway. I, so, I yeah. So I will find out who I heard that from. April? Um, yeah, and just in response to what Aaron was saying, I don't know um, when you took the Talonet course. Um, I took, or the online course, I took it recently, and I know that Cynthia did provide a lot of new updates to it. And okay. It's constantly under a process. Um, and so even when I was in it, you know, some things changed. And I, there were some things that you're saying that I think are similar in our experience, but there are other things that I, you know, that I felt it was more comprehensive. Um, I don't think it took 150 hours. Yeah, I agree. Um, but, it but I know that, I that she did a complete overhaul. Um, gosh, I think it was spring last year. Oh, okay. Um, and even then, it had changed a little bit as I, because I was kind of in the middle there. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. I took it in summer two years ago. 
So maybe, yeah. So and it, may, and it may be too that the things we're hearing, and I know that because she, uh, she had said she revised it because there were complaints where people had wanted more. So I don't know if this is the old system that people are talking about. Or this is the two faculty, when they saw this on the agenda last week, came to me and said that the uh, one faculty said 150 hours. I haven't done it, so I have no idea. But both faculty said it's incredibly laborious and much more work than necessary to teach an online class. I didn't feel like it was 150 hours. I don't know. To I mean, me, it's 90 degrees outside. It feels like 300. Yeah. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what the instructor just felt like 150. I really don't know. I mean, I figured there's assignments you just have to turn in. Like, there's busy work stuff. You have to prove you can do these things. But I didn't feel like, oh, it's unnecessary. I felt like it was fine. I'm just here for information. I've got this. I have never done this. I don't know how it even works. Chris? Chris? Oh, I was just going to say, in terms of the state, that you're right. Yes, the state is deciding on one. And what I heard was that there'll be a strong financial incentive for schools yes. to switch. Once they decide, they haven't decided yet, but it's not going to be Sakai. <laughs> right, it will not be Sakai. And this all goes along with the, um, the same movement to make sure everyone's taking the same assessment test. And so basically, because students are doing more swirling, moving between colleges, they want more consistency between colleges. And, and, uh, and there's a whole list of things they're doing. Those are just two of the things they're doing to get colleges all doing the same thing. Victor, and then Dan Klaus. As a student, it's concerning to hear that faculty, they don't feel like they learned what they were supposed to learn during the training. I think you had mentioned that, you know, <laughs> it's, you, you feel bad for the class. And as a student, that, you know, that's putting students' grades and possibility of transferring at risk. And um, a lot of students take online classes because they, you know, the registration is so tight here that we're not allowed to be inside most classes. So as someone who took an online class, we hear that, you know, some teachers aren't, or some professors aren't adequately trained or feel comfortable doing that, it's concerning. Yeah, if I could, if I could just comment on that, I, under, I, I know what that feels like, and I can tell you um, that as a, as a faculty, I, felt the, this, I feel the same way about the classes I taught 15 years ago my first time. Uh, I walked in there and I was like, oh, man, 15 years later, I was like, oh, I, I really didn't quite know what I was doing. Um, I think the, the level of instruction is, a, is appropriate. I have never seen that the first year. I just think as, with stu as being a student, you become a better student over time. As an instructor, you become a better instructor over time. So, um, But yeah, it, that happens. Dan? Well, I've taught Blackboard, I think, about five years previously at two other colleges before I came here and um, you know I through the years you worked your class in Blackboard and got it set the way you really wanted it and then I came here and then I had to do the training which was absolutely a complete waste of time uh, and uh, I learned nothing from it but actually I had to restart my class in Talonet set, set it all up because it was a lot different than Blackboard and just setting up your class alone it's the training that you need. And obviously, as you go through the years, I'm now in four years of teaching online here. I mean, I've mastered Talonet. I don't think it's a great platform for students here. Uh, there's a lot better platforms. And I, I think it's because it's, it's uh, no cost to the district. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. That's what I heard too. And that's part of the reason why that they use Talonet, is my guess. But uh, I would much rather teach at Blackboard and have it, the district support that. What I like about online before when I was teaching other classes is like Blackboard has an app on, on a student's phone. So I would encourage all my students, anytime I did an update, it would go immediately to their phones. And I knew, you know, it's advanced technology as opposed to talent. Um, those are just my opinions. <laughs> all right, any other discussion on that? All right, I'll take this list to Cynthia and hopefully she can come and address some of these issues as well as what they're doing. I will check on who told me we were looking at moving platforms, and I will get in contact with Stephanie Rosenthal. Just real quick, I want to highlight what Dan said, the idea of, of the training actually be helping you set up your class. That, that I think, is a good point that needs to be checkmarked. I'll just say the talent's not free. 
Okay, okay yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean okay. to say that. I, I just, mean, but it is yeah. a lot cheaper, which is yeah. why we got it, I think. And it was open source, and and the person here at the dean at the time thought it was, you know, the way to go. But um, it did allow them to give platforms to everyone, yeah. as opposed to just giving it to the, I don't know, 200 people who are teaching online or something. But I, I think that was one of the decisions. I, I'm not necessarily sticking up for now, but I'm just saying that was why they picked it. Yeah, I don't. It seems like everyone's a little hesitant to say anything. I don't. This is. I don't think this is necessarily good or bad. We just yeah. need to talk about it. Yeah. Anything else? All right. So I'll uh, I'll check into those things and ask uh, Cynthia to come back and address those issues. Um, and now Dr. Johnson is here. So Student Equity Committee. So I had. Um, this was great timing. Um, Dr. Johnson put this together shortly after. I had, oh, you have a hand up. Okay. Shortly after, um, I had requested from you permission to look into this and see if we could develop a committee. And it's uh, the following Tuesday, I did that, the following Thursday. So two days later, I did that, and it was already underway. So, yay, I'll have to do as much work. So, Dr. Johnson's here to go through this with us. Thank you. Um, so, uh, just a little reminder we talked, uh, I think, sometime in the early part of the fall about the student equity planning that was going on statewide. And those plans uh, were due by January 1st. We submitted ours uh, somewhere I think around the end of October and following board approval. And the plans address um, five um, indicators, and I'm sorry, six indicators and um, various groupings of students. Our plans are put, our plans put together to do um, uh, or give attention to all of those areas. To do, to carry out that work though, we need a group and we put in our plan that we would identify a uh, group for that purpose and um, operationalize it. And so that's what we're doing now by proposing a new shared governance committee that would go to coordinating council this coming Monday for action um, to put into place a shared governance committee specifically for student equity. And the committee um, has kind of two um, formats to it, and I think that's probably a good way to break down how it would operate, and, and, uh, and I say good in terms of making it more digestible. So first of all, going back to the summit that we did in June of 14, and then the summit we did in September of 14, those summits were populated by the task force, and the student equity task force, and that task force makes up the entirety of the proposed Shared Governance Committee on Student Equity. And that's what you're seeing in front of you. So that's one piece. A second piece, again to break this down a little bit, is that a subcommittee is proposed made up of the constituent group representatives and the co-chairs, Dr. Schilling and myself, to do the actual more frequent at certain times of the year uh, attention to requests for funding to carry out programs that will actually be designed to address the what are referred to as goals, activities, and expected outcomes in the student equity plans. So what we want to do is start putting the uh, more of the student equity money in the hands of the campus through a shared governance process and through one that will involve um, shared consideration of how to put some of the money to work to address the priorities that are in the plan. Then, so when we're doing funding, that subcommittee would be meeting more frequently. And then when we're not, it would not need to meet as frequently. Our plan calls for the task force to meet quarterly. And so that would be the idea. There would be about four meetings per year of the full, of the full shared governance committee. And this can evolve. Uh, the plans can be updated annually. Our design for this can be changed as we see what is fitting best for the campus's needs. Um, but in order to expedite uh, getting funding into people's hands, we want to have then that subcommittee able to put out and then receive requests for proposals for uh, funding for specific projects. So those, that's kind of big picture. We want to do a little more of drilling into some of the details. You'll see that in the membership, and again, this is based on the original task force that conducted both of the summits to put together the plan, the constituent group membership there at the bottom of the first page, and E for membership, first bullet constituent group rep, uh, membership, 
And again, that's the group that would make up the subcommittee to actually sit down and consider requests for proposals. <coughs> then the faculty resource leadership out of academic affairs calling for the coordinator CTX, IFalcon, and student success centers. And then faculty resource leadership out of student <coughs> services, counseling chairs, and DSPS faculty um, specialist or counselor. Then functional resource personnel uh, out of EOPS, adult education and diversity programs, counseling and institutional effectiveness planning and research, and, um, and business and HR as needed. And those, that group, uh, by the way, is actually this year. So that's the proposed structure. Again, following up on um, the purposes and priorities that are in our student equity plan to start putting, um, particularly to put resources behind getting the work done to carry out the, um, the goals, activities, and expected outcomes in those plans. Sure. Uh, since this committee hasn't been created yet, how are these decisions being made currently? So uh, currently the plans were just due in January and um, we have a few allocations that have been made to uh, move the budget along for this year because we have a deadline for spending. Um, and actually, good thing you brought the question up. I should mention that um, we have a short extension for spending um, to September 30th, but my professional group statewide um, advocacy and some others are pushing very hard for an extension to December 31st. I, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, and we've had to operate, of course, originally as if we expected the deadline to be June 30th. And then the extension to September 30th went back and forth. There was discussion, and then we got um, indication that it was approved. Um, whether or not this uh, very strong move to move it out, another three months will happen, we don't know. Um, but in the meantime, we put into place uh, funding uh, for different projects that will help move some of this money along. We still have um, chunks to go through, even for this short time period, that once we get the committee in place, it can sit down and look at requests to get some money going in the few months we have left. And then, realistically, we'll go to a different kind of calendar in subsequent years. Right now, that, that subcommittee would need to meet to do funding here in the spring, but ordinarily, We'd want it to be in a, or here in the early spring. Ordinarily, we'd want it probably near the latter part of the spring or mid-spring, prepping for money that can be released July 1st of each year, and then that would need to be um, spent within a 12-month period. So this year's going to be a little bit different in terms of expediting uh, the money into resources that will directly benefit students. And then in subsequent years, we're probably looking at a, a request that would go out to the campus for the committee to start working on those mid, probably mid-spring so that it can get decisions out to folks before they leave and then the money can be released July 1st. Okay, but currently how are decisions being made? Okay. Okay, so Who's actually making a decision currently to steer funding to specific? Oh, okay, so Executive Council has had to look at some major projects that um, went through, um, and, I, and I shouldn't say only Executive Council. So in last year's uh, unit division and area planning process, um, we knew that money was coming along for not only student equity, but 3SP. And so when we did um, institutional allocations for funding specific projects, um, we, we were able to point to 3SP dollars for certain things. That's a much more limited um, scope. Um, 3SP is highly regulated. Student equity is broader in terms of the allowances, so we have a little more latitude there. Um, but then those um, allocation recommendations, and again, it could have been from 3SP, student equity, general fund, vintage funds, or some other special um, resource. I think there was a recommendation to ask ASCC for assistance with one, of, one or two of the projects. Anyway, those went through Planning and Budget Committee and Executive Council. Um, uh, the faculty resources leadership, the, I'm not clear on why CTX or I Falcon would be in there. I do see the, the uh, Student Success Center, um, but I would really prefer that CTX and I Falcon coordinator not be at the physio, 
but part of the faculty seats, increasing that to three, of which that can include the CTX or IFAC, and I'm not, I don't see a direct relationship between student equity and those two positions. Okay, so I, pro I probably should say um, that, by the way, the ex officio designation, um, um, I know sometimes in some bodies that takes away a vote. Um, it's not intended to take a vote away, if that's a concern. I don't know if it is, but it's not. Um, but the um, thinking there was, had more to do with, um, um, there's a, an element with, well, there's some carryover theme, theme, I'm sorry, from 3SP with regard to staff development, professional development. And um, we also are considering that for student equity funding. And from that aspect, we thought it helpful to have CTX. But you've, uh, already, you've already got the, you've got the Vice President of Human Resources on that. Right. So staff development is specific to the CTI. No. So no, that's why I'm not seeing the direct line between the CTX being representing on the student equity team. Why that couldn't just be an additional faculty. Yeah. Because you've got, the, as far as staff development, you have the Human Resources right. Vice President. Right. Okay. I, 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 this was the, um, again, this was the, the uh, membership and the format we put together for the summits. And again, the thinking was that people who are uh, close to the ground in terms of doing the kinds of priorities <coughs> that were anticipated in, in not only student equity. Student equity, closing the achievement gap funds came about um, uh, probably worth stepping back a second. If you recall when I talked to you all in the early part of the fall, um, I specified and I have been saying it to a number of groups because I think it's worthy. I'm not singing to the choir with you. I think it's really worthy of pointing out that it was the statewide Senate over the years that kept stepping in when all of the new performance requirements and expectations for student success were being talked about. It was the students. It was the faculty senate statewide that said, "Hey, we have to pay attention to student equity, and we've got to revive that process, and we've got to get that as part of what's happening with loss of enrollment priority requirements for mandatory AOC uh, coming up, loss of bog fee waiver eligibility, and so on." So, um, so that was worked in, and part of that um, attention was to make sure that we were including faculty and faculty development in everything that had to do with closing the achievement gap in, in student uh, staff development, professional development, what have you. So that's where that came from. Yeah, I just, again, I would like, I would like that to be a faculty, not, not specifically the coordinator of the CTX. I'm not, I'm not sure that there's any difference between me sitting there listening to what should be occurring in professional development and saying and giving a suggestion versus the coordinator being there. I mean, the coordinator is just organizing. <coughs> they're already taking advice from faculty. Uh -huh. So I prefer to see, especially that coordinator of CTX, just be five faculty seats instead of four. And I'm, I'm not seeing a connection with the I Falcon either. Because you, you've got the, you saw the faculty on it, but you also have four students. Right. So. Victor? Uh, in regards to those four students, Right. See appointed by AACC, and then when we go back here to uh, part F, number two, it says AACC representatives will serve in terms concurrent with their AACC term of office up to one year. So is that stating that someone who is in office will be a student representative, or are student representatives as a whole? It's not exclusive to somebody who's in office. So um, good catch, and we'll um, address that. Follow up. Um, appointed by AACC. So will that be like student senate, or would that be administrators of students? Uh, no, it's the student government makes the appointments. And um, the language otherwise in that section is consistent with the language for, if not all, almost all of the shared governance committees on the campus. So um, having to do with a one-year term and having to do with appointment being the responsibility of students. Yes, I'm just trying to think through because I understand you know, from the original uh, group that you were <coughs> No, five completion indicators. Six basic. populations, five indicators. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, completion basic skills, right? Right. Transfer velocity. Right. Access. Um, and degree and uh, certificate completion. Okay. 
Did you say that already? Okay, so it's access, course completion, oh. degree and certificate complete. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I think I just want to kind of think through. So when I think about basic skills, for example, then maybe there ought to be you know, specifically someone represented by the English, or represented by the English department, or you know, the SL or MAP. Right. Mm -hmm. He's just dying to do this. He just added his name to the paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would agree, you know, and I think it's very similar to what we do with enrollment management. So we want a very specific faculty on that where we said we wanted to counsel around them. I would agree with you. I think maybe those four, hopefully six faculty, would then be outlined as to we should be someone from basic skills, someone from training. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. Sure. We talked about um, just identifying the, the goals, the activities, and expected outcomes. I understand that that was part of the summit work and that's part of the plan, and, and you submitted that already. One of the things that you said was that looking at going into next year, we understand that our funding is going to be matching next year or something close to the $2.6 million. More for, uh, for we, well, I suspect more for student equity and 3SP, and I think that's what's, I shouldn't say suspect, I think that's what's in the proposal. So something close to that. So in terms of thinking about like support programs, academic support programs, retention programs, thinking about the idea with basic skills, you have programs like the learning communities, you have the Moja that's newly um, formed and, and ongoing now and developing. There's a need for that kind of support though, and like a real detailed, Conversations about how to really help these programs, you know, succeed. Right. Right. You know, when they're going. Right. So when you talk about allocation of the access to the money, the criteria for that is that so who's going to generate that criteria, and how is that going to be communicated? Um, uh, that's one of the reasons why the full committee um, is so important because <coughs> you bring. Um, uh, you're getting at pedagogical issues and how we um, how we're addressing carrying out the, the um, goals, activities, and expected outcomes. And the full committee can bring to mind those kinds of priorities, um, those kinds of um, specifications if they're not already um, clear in the student equity plan itself. So, for instance, there won't be enough time with the funding schedule this year for the full committee to have enough mindful considerations of these different factors to lay out some additional priorities. So we will rely on what we put into the student equity plan itself for priorities in this first round of funding. And then in the future, those, those um, goals, activities, and expected outcomes still need to be leading the way, but the committee can talk about um, pedagogical issues, implementation issues, um, programming issues, service issues around the campus, those kinds of things that will help uh, inform the decision making of the group, the subcommittee that would make recommendations on actual funding. Um, so I, I want to refer to, uh, you know, the student equity um, that you guys are trying to yes. spend on this year, right? Um, so um, the last board meeting, there was appointment of students. Um, part-time. Um, that's from the equity money? Yes. Okay, and the decision as as far as um, you're saying was from the executive council, right? The, um, the funding recommendations um, were that went through planning and budget were more general than that. Um, so it wasn't specific to that particular allocation. Oh. I don't, um, I have two more. Yeah, but I'm sorry to interrupt you, Michelle. I just should comment that Remember that, uh, for those of you who weren't um, privy to the discussion in the board meeting, the um, decisions that were made there were to support student engagement as a component of student equity. So, just background. Sorry. That's okay. I just have one other question. The idea of being a faculty specialist or counselor, um, they don't have a chair. That seems like that should be a consistent chair. Um, yeah, and that. <laughs> yeah, should have I don't. I was going to actually say maybe we don't have the chair specifically for counseling, so, but, you know, maybe a counseling rep. I was just starting to list out perhaps the ex officio faculty members, because um, we have six of them already listed. Right. And I'm wondering if there should be one for me to come from the SL, one for math, one for counseling, you know, the SPS and student success. I mean, that would be the same number of faculty, but a little bit more targeted. Yeah. Uh, advertise to the That's a good idea too. It, it just seems very obvious. You've got chair, chair, and then anybody. 
mean, I know some people who, who, you know, who worked on this last year, right. it just happened to be right. these folks, but... Right. Okay. Sure. Sure. And I think the, the uh, discussion's good. So, the idea is to get the expertise in there, again, for the very kinds of discussions I was referring to, whether they're service, programmatic, pedagogical, I think like what Dr. Johnson said about um, the funds that we use for student engagement, that um, from the view of the student and student senate, it was, it was an executive decision to appoint to students that they thought, or they saw in their own opinions as head of student engagement, that they're the ones who are more likely to be student engaged. And um, it'll be in my report, but that student senate does not agree with that. And um, there'll be conversations from other students and with that. Is it possible, rather than making, um, it seems like there's still an awful lot of questions, so maybe if we go to coordinating, uh, is this going to coordinating on Monday? Yes. We can get some recommendations and bring this back on Tuesday based on what coordinating says. Um, or if you want to take recommendations into coordinating, if we resolve it on Monday, then that, because that, I, I, I don't know that people are, you know, um, that this is that selection. The point is to give faculty resources who can bring subject area expertise to the group. Um, it's not more than that. So, well, yeah. I'm really liking Tracy's idea. Yeah, uh, the I, same kind of thing we did with enrollment management. We had specific right. faculty that the Senate then appoints from that group. Right, and yeah. Tracy's point is getting at that very point. The yep. subject area expertise maybe look at it differently. Um, so, which is, gets the job done. So, are there any objections to me taking these recommendations? Thank you. Reports. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh